So I'm Zhe Chen. I'm currently a Human Centered AI Postdoc Fellow at Stanford University. Uh, thank you for coming here today. So today I'm going to introduce a topic that is about my past research, which is to uncover and to address the distribution grid vulnerability to wildfire enabled infrastructure informatics. So let's get so for this picture, does anyone know where it is? Yeah, it's a gold, thank you. So it's a San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, this was, uh, this thing was uh, September 9, 2020 on the morning. And uh, this uh, real orange sky was caused by the scale wildfires in Northern California. And uh, we know wildfires can damage our energy infrastructures like power lines, but uh, power lines, the energy infrastructure themselves can also be a major cause of destructive wildfires. For example, in California's history, the largest complex wildfire, non-complex wildfires and the most deadly wildfires, both power line ignitions. And because our electric grids are interconnected systems, a local system fault, like a local power line ignitions can have non-local impacts because the failure, the, uh, because we share the same electric grid, so the failure can cascade across the interconnected systems. And also we share the same atmosphere, the wildfires caused by the local, can also impact the people far beyond the locality. So there are three lines of defense to mitigate such a coupled risk of electric grid and wildfires. The first one, the first line of defense is the wildfire preven prevention. For example, we can make the wildfire prediction and the detection more accurate. And uh, also we can, uh, in estimate to improve the, our grid asset, like put the power lines on the ground or insulate the power lines or upgrade our, our grid asset, like the changing, upgrading the transformers with a better wildfire resilient, resistant materials and uh, also upgrade the materials of the poles. And uh, there are other kinds of approach to mitigate the risks of for example, we can do the free, the regular vegetation man, man, management, or as our last resort, we can cut off the like pre, uh, proactively to preemptively cut off our power supply in order to reduce the chance of power line from uh, ign igniting the, the from ignitions. And the, the second lines of the wildfire response and the mitigation. Uh, that is used during the wildfire, after a wildfire occurred. Uh, that includes the wildfire monitoring and tracking, and uh, also the modeling and the surprise suppression. And the third line of defense is after the wildfire how happened, how can we make the community quickly recover from the disasters? So propelled uh, preparation at the beginning, like we can improve our logistics preparedness and uh, make the uh, in energy contingency plan in advance. So there are three lines of defense, but our best case is that we can reduce the chance of the wildfires to prevent from prevent the wildfires from happening. So uh, here are some different measures for wildfire preventions. And we can see for power line on the grounding, it has the two aspects of the advantage. It can both reduce the prevent the fault or failures, and also it can reduce the chance of the ignitions. And also there are other kinds of measures like vegetation management, and also the proactive de-energization, which can also reduce power line ignitions. So among all these wildfire prevention approaches, on the grounding, 
is one of the most effective approaches, but it is super costly. Here shows some empirical evidence of how effective the wild file, uh, how effective the on-the-grounding is. And according to the data of the PGND, you can see that if we can on-the-ground all power lines, that is 100%, then the, the number of the utility-induced ignitions can be reduced to zero. And uh, this applies to both the high file, high wild file threat errors and, and the low file threat errors. So that means that if we can on the ground those power lines, we can greatly reduce the chance of the power line ignition. Uh, on the other aspect, this kind of the measure is super expensive. It costs three million dollars per mile. So that it also prevents this, this measure being deployed at a large scale. So to understand how the different kinds of the wildfire prevention approach are being implemented across different communities and uh, come up with those uh, climate risk adapt measures and the investment plans, we need the data, the information, but unfortunately, the spatially resolved data for characterizing such risks and for capturing the existing implementation of this different kind of approach are largely only available. For example, we don't know what is the exposure of those power lines to uh, including wildfires. And the, compiled to transmission grids, which are like the trunks of a, like the trunks of a tree. Distribution grids are more like the branches of the tree. They are highly distributed, and they can be more easily affected by those climate-induced extreme events. But we don't have those spatially resolved data to capture local characteristics. So the key problem here is how can we bridge the information gap for such highly distributed system and to measure the, the exposure of the distribution grids to wildfires at a spatially resolved level. So previous methods for modeling and mapping the distribution grids are usually based on the grid measure, actually based on the measurements of the uh of the of the nodes or called buses at of the distribution grid this kind of approach assume the availability of the uh knowledge of where those nodes are and also the measurements the small grid measurements at each node so that they can leverage the measurement to find the the connections between in this way, they can reconstruct the, the topology of the distribution grid. But this kind of the approach cannot, cannot be applied to the more broad, the broader scenario that we don't have any prior knowledge about the distribution grid. We don't know where those nodes are, and we don't have those measurements because the small meter deployment is still quite low. Not just the, uh, even in the US, there are less than 50% penetration rates. So how can we um, like map our distribution grids from scratch without those prior knowledge? So in my research, I have proposed a framework that is called AI enabled infrastructure informatics. Unlike tra traditional approaches, it doesn't, it, it, it's not constrained, but by what is available at hand. It's to extract those information from widely available unstructured observational data like satellite images, aerial images, and street views. And uh, I developed those uh, AI, the domain-tailored AI models, or more specifically, machine learning models to process these observational data and to generate a large-scale uh, Spatially resolve the data about those distributed energy systems, including the 
solar PVs and the distribution grids. And in this presentation, I will mainly introduce how you could I developed such models for mapping the distribution grids. So we know the street view images can contain granular information about those utility poles and the power lines and other Instead of using those commonly seen the horizontal views, here we use the upward views because we can directly capture the power line directions and the utility pole orientations from these upward views. But street view images can only capture the over, overhead parts of the grid. So how can we further capture the on the ground lines? So which is heuristic. It's based on two assumptions. First, we assume buildings tend to be connected to the nearby grid nearby power lines rather than power lines that are far away. So under this assumption, after we use the machine learning models to detect those overhead power lines in street views, then we can overlay them with a map of buildings to obtain those buildings, the predicted overhead lines within a certain distance. To do this, after we use machine learning to detect the overhead lines, then we can use it to generate a mass covering those buildings that can be reached within a certain radius. And uh, our second assumption is that all buildings are connected to the grid, which uh, means that the electrification rates of building 100%, which is a reasonable assumption in many developing countries like the US. So under this assumption, if a building is not connected by the overhead lines, then it must be connected by the on the ground lines in some way so that we can use a graph algorithm, which is a modified version of Dyke's algorithm to find the most likely path to connect those buildings to the grid and use the generated path generated by this algorithm as the prediction of the over of the on the ground lines. So here we further here I further visualize the dynamic process of how those paths are being generated as the prediction of the on the ground lines in the cities. So the, here we shows how those on the ground lines are are being predicted. So let's go back to revisit the entire framework. So this model can estimate the both the on the ground and the uh, overhead lines. It starts from the street view images, which is straightforward. We can estimate the pole look, uh, orientation and also the power line directions from these images. Although we only provide the labels, the labels are just specified as like whether an image contains solar uh, contains power lines or not. So it's a binary label, but the model can automatically learn how to estimate the pole orientations and the line directions. So it is called a semi-supervised learn. So after estimate the pole orientation, we can then use those information to localize the poles on the map, the latitude and the longitude of each utility pole. And then it will be combined with the road network information to predict whether there is a connection between two uh, utility poles. And finally, we leverage the method we just introduced to further estimate the on the ground lines. So in this way, we can obtain a comprehensive map of the distribution grids contained overhead and on the ground parts of the grid. So this model was developed with the data in California, but also it can generalize to other parts of the world, including those areas where the electricity access remain limited, like cities in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we found that such model can achieve a precision of around 80 to 90% and a recall of around 80% in both California and Sub-Saharan Africa. 
Here, the precision means the fraction of the dis predicted distribution grid of which the actual grid can be reached within a radius of 20 meter. And recall means the fraction of the actual distribution grid that can be detected within this same radius. And we further leverage mo this model to estimate the fraction of the power lines, distribution power lines in each census block group in California. Census block group is a small geographic unit, which is much smaller than zip code. And uh, we find that our model can achieve the R square of 80 to 91% in both the uh, Northern California and the Southern California. And uh, in this way, we can obtain the uh, on the ground rate, which is the distribution grid being buried on the ground in every census block group in California, then we can use this map and further superimpose it with a map of the predictive wildfire rates. And here we use the annual probability of wildfires from 2026 to 2050, which is projected using the environmental and the, the predicted and the, also the climate projection in high and after overlaying these two geospatial distribution, we can then characterize how those distribution grids in different areas are getting exposed to the future, uh, to the wildfire threats. So here shows some results. And we, we divide these results into both the pg and &E territory and the Southern California Edison or SCE territory and the all aggregate both of them. So there are three figures here. So here we measure how we want to analyze the correlation between the wildfire threat, the power line on the grounding uh, status, and also the local social economic status, like income levels. And we find that in pg and &E's territory, actually low fire threat areas actually have threat areas actually have lower on the grounding rates, which means that the on the grounding actually doesn't necessarily come into the community that need them the most. And also we find that in both the pg and &E and the SCE territory, at the same level of the wildfire threats, low income communities actually have lower fraction of the power lines being on the grounding. That means that communities in California actually receive the less on the grounding protection. And we further overlay the power line status map, the distribution grid map with the tree canopy map to uh, estimate how those overhead lines are getting, are in how they are in proximity to nearby vegetations. And uh, here we consider the tree high that can affect the power lines. And we find that in pg and &E's territory, actually low-income communities uh, have higher fraction of the power lines in proximity to nearby vegetations, which is a risk factor of power line ignition. But uh, this phenomenon doesn't exist in Southern California at uh, its territory. So that suggests that practice of this uh, vegetation management and uh, highly heterogeneous across different utilities. And uh, further, we leverage the data of the utilities to get the information about the utility pool materials. And we find that in pg and &E's territory, actually lower income communities also have higher fraction of wood more vulnerable to other materials. So that means that besides the power line on the grounding, the overhead power lines and the utility poles in low-income communities also are more vulnerable to wildfires. So besides these uh, power line characteristics, we also correlate our data with the uh, solar adoption rates, which is a 
in another project called Deep Solar. We find that because we know that solar PVs can be used as a backup source for generating power when the major grid is disconnected uh, due to the wildfire threat or due to the preemptive de-energization. And we find that at the same level of the wildfire threats, low-income communities have lower uh, adopt solar adopter. That means that it has lower renewable distributed energy resources for preparedness of uh, the preemptive de-energization. So this suggests that the low-income communities in California are suffering from three levels of disparities. They have lower fraction of the power lines being undergrounded, and their overhead lines and poles are also more vulnerable to wildfires. And also, in the face of the uh, PSPS or other preemptive energization events, they also have less preparedness because of the lower adoption of the renewable resources. So this kinds of disparities may reflect some sorts of inadequacy in our current policies. There are base, two basic schemes to allocate the cost of on the grounding. The first is wide cost allocation, which means the cost of on the grounding is shared by all utility customers with an increase in their electricity bills. And the examples of this scheme include the Rule 28, defined by the California Public Utilities Commissions, or CPUC. And pg and &E also has an ambitious plan to underground 10,000 miles of uh, power lines, and they also plan to allocate the cost. And the second uh, cost allocation scheme is what we call the local cost allocation, which means the cost of undergrounding is only paid locally by local communities or municipalities. And examples of this scheme include the Rule 20B and the Rule 20C defined by the CPUC. So let's consider what, so here shows some examples. Uh, rule 20A, the rate, which means the on the grounding cost is funded by rate payers. And uh, also the pg and one to 10,000 miles plan are belong to the utility-wide cost allocation, uh, allocation. But one thing to note that the, the, there's some eligibility, eligibility criteria for this Rule 28, but they're primarily focused on the aesthetics of this purpose. Like if a overhead power lines affect the local traffic or reduce the aesthetics, then they're eligible for these rate payer funded projects. But neither the wildfire rates nor the income level was considered as part of the existing eligibility criteria. And the uh, Rule 20B and the Rule 20C, which means that and they are belong to the belonging to the local cost. That if local communities want to bury power lines because of the wildfire rates, they have to go to the Rule 20B or Rule 20C. So that means they need to pay the locally to underground their local power lines in order to mitigate the wildfire risk. So let's consider different scenarios. So what if we apply local cost allocation to all communities so that to further bury those lines in the future for wildfire prevention? So what cost they need to bear? So here we show the low cost can only be shot within different neighborhoods or census block group. Then we can see in both the pg and &E and the SE territory, low-income communities need to build much higher cost of undergrounding per household. Uh, so then the wildfire threats. So that means that if we uh, apply local cost allocation to all communities, then low-income communities may not be able to afford the undergrounding at all. So this prevents them from further reducing the local wildfire risk. But what if we apply utility-wide cost allocation to all communities? Then if PG&E underuse 
the ground, 10,000 miles of uh, power lines, then the electricity bill of all customers will increase by 50 to 100%. So many people living in areas with no wildfire rates, but they still need to bear the cost. So that will not be accepted by most residents. But what if we combine them both? What if, as we have already seen that low income, com uh, high income, are more likely to bury power lines by themselves. So what if we apply utility-wide cost allocation to communities whose income level is below a threshold X and apply local cost allocation to all communities? So let's see what will happen under different threshold X. Here, what we care about is a relative cost of undergrounding, which means the undergrounding cost per household at the shell First thing we care about is the average relative cost, uh, which means the and uh, if we apply local cost allocation to all communities, then the average relative cost is here. And the second thing we care about is uh, uh, whether this relative cost can be equitably distributed. So we further plot the correlation between the household income and the and we can see if we apply local cost allocation to all communities, then low-income communities need to bear much higher cost relative to their income. So what if we increase the uh, income threshold X to 50K? Then we can see the average relative cost uh, will decrease. And the relative cost for low-income communities will also decrease. So what if income threshold X to 100K, then we can see the average relative cost will further decrease. And now the relative cost will become much more homogeneous across communities at different income levels. But what if we further increase the income threshold X to 150K or even apply utility-wide cost allocation to all communities? Then we can see, actually, in this case, the average relative cost will in the opposite direction. And uh, under this, this scenario, the relative cost, the distribution of the relative cost will again become biased against those low-income communities. So here, what we find is that using either local cost allocation or utility-wide cost allocation alone may not be optimal. Instead, combining both of them with the cutoff threshold at the one and make the power line on the grounding equitably affordable to communities at all income levels. And we find that such optimal threshold at around 100K is optimal for both the pg and &E and SE territory. And based on this research, we also actively engage the local utilities like by providing advisory support for pg and &E for the miles power line on the grounding program. So here are some key takeaway messages. So uh, what we find here is that the first is the existing the status quo of the power line on the grounding and the exposure of the distribution grids to wildfires. We find that low income communities suffer from three levels of this power at the same level of wildfire threats. First, they have lower fraction of the power lines being buried on the ground. Second, their overhead parts of the grid, including their overhead utility poles and power lines, and also more vulnerable to wildfires. And besides that, in the face of those potential and which potentially more frequent uh, preemptive organization like the PSPS event, they also have less renewable adoption in the preparation for those uh, potential wildfire reduced outages. And the second, we find that uh, this kind of the uh, disparities may be rooted in the existing cost allocation scheme. So current cost allocation for power line on the ground 
function purpose, we not actually consider the wildfowl rates nor the income levels. So if we can only show the utility, uh, show the power line on the grounding locally, that means it's called the local cost allocation scheme. Then low income communities need to pay disproportionately higher cost per household to on the ground existing file, uh, file from overhead lines. That means they not just have the uh, less power, uh, le less res uh, resilience to wildfires in the past. They also lack the ability to further mitigate such risks to improve their local resilience in the future because of the affordability. And uh, also, if we apply utility-wide uh, cost allocation to all communities, not optimal because they will increase the electricity bill for all customers. So instead, we find that combining both the local and the utility-wide cost allocation schemes and with the cutoff threshold, income threshold at around 100K, can make the on-the-grounding equitably affordable to communities at all income levels. And this research was also uh, covered by many, including the, the Hill, the, uh, and also the Tech Explore, and also Stanford News. And in the future, there are, uh, we also have a lot of things to do, especially our current wildfire projection, given different climate scenarios, do not consider the infrastructure because we know the infrastructure itself could be a risky factor, like the power lines can ignite those destructive wildfires. So in the view, future, we are asking, like, can we actually incorporate a spatially resolved distribution grid, distribution grid information uh, into the wildfire risk projection so that it can better capture the compounded risks of both the infrastructures and also the uh, climate-induced wildfire threats. And also, given the, uh, in the expensive cost of obtaining those liner data, so can we merely using those 2D street view images to inspect power lines, like to characterize the distance between the power lines on the nearby trees to measure to measure where to identify whether the uh, power, the nearby tree branches will uh, intrude into the corridor of the distribution power lines. So then it can be an efficient way to do the rapid inspection of the nearby power lines. And even the local residents can use their phones to uh, measure whether the, they have some risks for their local power lines. So I think there are a lot of things to explore in the future by combining such the infrastructure, detailed infrastructure information and the climate projection, especially the risk of the climate induced. Experience. Hope you're excited as me for such uh, interdisciplinary research journey to use AI and data science to make our infrastructure systems more resilient and more sustainable. And thank you for listening. So now it's open for questions.